Welcome to the second part of Criminal Justice Natters with me, Ed Johnston, where I'm joined by Professor Dimitrios Giannopoulos. And in the second part of Dimitrios's talk, he examines human rights, the Eurosceptic right, and the need for activist legal academics. Uh, let's get to it. So I think it will be possible to, to see the similarities uh, in a sense uh, between part one of uh, of uh, my uh, professorial address tonight and uh, and part two. So in uh, part one, I took a uh, criminal process as an illustration uh, of the influence uh, that constitutional and human rights have had or should have in uh, in domestic law. I've also spoken about the connections that should exist uh, between different legal systems. Uh, I have explained how legal cosmopolitanism is the, is the key idea that is at the very heart of uh, the book, that is very central to, to the book. Uh, and, and so I want to follow this up um, by trying to perhaps contextualize or, or demonstrate to you how this, this work or this uh, empathy with human rights or passion for, uh, for human rights that has uh, uh, informed um, my specialist, uh, you know, criminal procedure uh, work uh, has also influenced uh, other uh, forms of uh, of activity that I've again been privileged to lead on or or undertake, uh, um, be that in my you know, previous institution uh, or uh, more specifically uh, at Goldsmiths, where I've been leading on uh, the new law department there, the creation of uh, a number of new undergraduate law programs. Um, the migration of uh, uh, research uh, centers and uh, think tanks and other initiatives I've previously been leading on, how they have been embedded uh, in the new department and also how they have been injected into the actual curriculum. So there are three key elements in my presentation tonight. I want to speak to you, uh, uh, you know, ideologically, uh, about how human rights has has influenced my my work and and how you know that's my message or aspiration if I can put it this way uh, human rights uh, legal cosmopolitanism uh, the need for open uh, intellectual uh, borders the need to connect with uh, with others um, the need uh, to combat uh, populist uh, nationalist uh, ideas how they need to be absolutely central part and parcel of, uh, of our work uh, in uh, you know our work in its different um, iterations manifestations you know um, uh, regardless of where of whether you are uh, uh, an academic teacher or student uh, or uh, a member of the public uh, how this engagement with human rights is absolutely crucial vital at, at this uh, at this time and I will do that uh, uh, with reference to three, the three key axes uh, of uh, of activity, as far as my work has is is concerned, you know, the work over the last few years. Uh, so the, the first is the academic think tank, the Britain in Europe think tank, and um, that very much uh, um, revolved naturally around uh, uh, the idea, uh, and you know, it, it came about at the time of or, or, or a few months prior. Uh, to the EU referendum, and so very much the revolved around uh, Brexit. Uh, then, uh, secondly, the Knowing Our Rights uh, project, uh, which is work uh, research project that was uh, funded uh, uh, by Open Society Foundations and uh, the Open Society Initiative uh, uh, for uh, Europe, and that ran for two years. I mean, the funded element, uh, but that should not be an obstacle. Um, you know, one uh, once uh, we had got past uh, uh, the funded uh, element uh, of of the project, uh, we were able um, to inject uh, aspects of the project into the curriculum uh, and into other aspects of our activity at uh, at Goldman. So perhaps again, an illustration of how research projects, you know, do not necessarily have to to come to an end if there is uh, an intrinsic value in continuing with them. Uh, it may be possible. Uh, you know, if departments, of, if, if law departments and you know, other parts of academia are active enough, uh, they can perhaps 
create space for them for them to be accommodated. And that's what happened with the Knowing Our Rights project. And the third pillar or third axis uh, is the, the Department of Law itself uh, and the new law program at, at Goldsmiths, where it's the ambition was to ensure that the program was not going to be sterile. Uh, the program was not going to be devoid of all these influences that you know, I was privileged enough to bring with uh, with me that I had created and was working on. Um, and, 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 you know, work that that kind of work is now being undertaken uh, by all uh, those that have uh, engaged with the team, that have joined the team in the last in the last two years. Um, because there is uh, there is an intellectual identity in what the department is aiming to to create in terms of uh, engagement with questions that relate to human rights, international law, the rule of law, uh, social justice. So I, I, I hope, I trust, I believe this has created a sort of natural attraction. Um, and, and, and so in the last round of, of applications for our three lectureships, uh, we have seen significant uh, focus in, uh, in the applications that we have received, you know, these applications were quite naturally focused on these themes because we had been, I think, quite able, uh, thankfully, to communicate that these these are the matters, these are the issues that matter to, to us uh, and that there is a specific identity in uh, in this law program and a specific uh, mission around this, around which this, this program revolves. So I, I simply want to take a few uh, illustrations uh, from uh, from these themes, um, but let me first uh, place all that in the, in the current uh, uh, political, cultural, ideological context. Uh, um, I, I would love to come back and discuss all that in more detail. So I, I will simply give you the the, high, the highlights. Uh, um, it's it's getting quite late, and uh, uh, if I were to go into detail in all uh, this, then. Uh, we would nay, we need to take until quite late this uh, this evening, uh, but let me give you the highlights of uh, where we are. First of all, with uh, human rights, and I think the key observation here is that we are uh, witnessing, observing the transformation of uh, the threats that uh, domestic human rights are facing in, uh, in the UK. So we went from a direct uh, threat to repeal the Human Rights Act that was part and parcel. Uh, of uh, the Conservative uh, Party manifesto back in 2015 uh, to a more nuanced approach uh, where we were the Conservative Party, not we, uh, committed uh, to staying in the European Convention on Human Rights until Brexit is complete. That's what Theresa May's manifesto did, said back in 2017. We were going to stay in the European Convention on Human Rights uh, until the process of Brexit is complete. So the process of Brexit is more or less complete. Of course, we still have no clue uh, what that means in terms of the future relationship, but in terms of having withdrawn from the EU, that process is complete. So these, these questions are now absolutely pertinent. And then the 2019 uh, manifesto complicated uh, things even uh, further. Uh, so we're not going to repeal the, the act, we're not going to stay until we go. Should we stay or should we go, I suppose is the question here. Um, we are going to update the Human Rights Act. Uh, as it happens, uh, Robert Buckland uh, is uh, is going to appear before uh, the Joint Committee on Human Rights tomorrow. I can't remember the exact time, but he's, uh, he's going to appear uh, before the Joint Committee on Human Rights. I um, think you can all follow live. Uh, and some of the questions that I have identified tonight, uh, I was pleased to see are the questions uh, that the Joint Committee is going to be asking uh, Robert Buckland. And I, I hope he has some positive answers to offer, though I'm not terribly optimistic. So perhaps the Joint Committee will be asking about uh, the UK government's refusal to commit uh, to the European Convention on Human Rights as an essential element of future partnership with the EU. Uh, put simply, in the last few months, since withdrawal, so since last January, when we have formally uh, left the European Union, uh, the UK government has been refusing, uh, and the EU, was, the EU was putting a lot of pressure uh, on it uh, to commit formally to the European Convention on Human Rights as part of the future relationship, with it, and, and, and the UK government has so far refused. I understand there has been a little bit of progress in uh, more recent uh, uh, part of the negotiation, but again, there's nothing is certain in that uh, respect. Uh, uh, and in recent weeks, uh, other much more worrying episodes in this saga 
uh, of uh, hostility towards the European uh, Convention of Human Rights and the Human Rights Act. Uh, so we're beginning to see an effort to undermine uh, to undermine uh, the Human Rights uh, Act by stealth, dilute the European Convention of Human Rights influence. They oversee operations. Uh, Bill provides provides a key uh, illustration. Uh, again, it's it's something that we would uh, need a whole uh, uh, to, you know, dedicate a whole lecture on uh, on uh, that uh, to discuss it in uh, in more detail. But I'll, I'll simply highlight what uh, Colmo Kinidi has uh, UCL's Colmo Kinidi said uh, on uh, that uh, to us uh, two weeks ago when we celebrated the 70 years of the European Convention of Human Rights at Goldsmiths. So he spoke about the death by a thousand cuts. That that is uh, the new face of the threat that the Human, human Rights Act is, is facing, rather than a big bank a repeal of the Human Rights Act. And Nadia Omara from Liberty said that this might be, in terms of NGOs, in terms of how NGOs, how Liberty in that case, can go about fighting this uh, and tackling this, this threat. Um, it, it's an even more complex uh, uh, process uh, because, uh, you know, the government is going to take um, uh, away protections bit by bit, and it's it immediately becomes much more difficult to confront uh, or raise awareness about these threats in the way that you might be able to do so uh, if you were simply discussing about a, a complete repeal of uh, of the act. Uh, and we also need to connect that. We need to see the wider picture here. So for years we were discussing. Uh, uh, the potential threats to the Human Rights Act, the European Convention of Human Rights. But now the situation is much more worrying. Uh, and, and I think, you know, again, nothing that I will mention uh, here is going to come as a surprise to, to you. So Miller won, for instance, and the attacks on our on, on the judges in the High Court that followed that. Uh, you know, the, the, the sheer defiance of the separation of, of, of powers uh, as uh, far as the prorogation of parliament is concerned. Then the direct attacks from the part of government upon the Supreme uh, Court um, following Miller to the Cherry uh, case on the prorogation of Parliament. More recently, in recent weeks, uh, an ambition uh, to review, judicial review, and of course the deeply frustrating, extremely worrying attacks on activist lawyers who frustrate efforts to deport people with no right to remain in the UK. That was in the video from the Home Office or in part of the Home Office over the summer. That was quickly deleted. And yet Priti Patel uh, repeated the mantra, the rhetoric uh, there, the do-gooders, the lefty lawyers, the Labour Party, they were responsible for broken appeals. You know, we activist lawyers, activist legal academics potentially are responsible for broken the broken appeals immigration system. And it's um, it's a threat. Uh, it's uh, that, that, that Boris Johnson, that our prime minister has repeated. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a rhetoric that he has confirmed. We need to protect the whole criminal justice system for, from what the Home Secretary would doubtless and rightly, he said, call the lefty human rights lawyers and other do-gooders. I mean, it's it, it, it's it's quite counterintuitive that uh, the term do-gooder is used in order to indicate uh, something allegedly evil. The do-gooders are the new evil, perhaps. And again, every week there is a new threat. And now we, we read only in the last few days, I think it was in the Telegraph during the weekend, that uh, there is a plan, a plan is being worked up to rename the Supreme Court and to curtail, to reduce its constitutional uh, powers. And of course, um, you know, I haven't mentioned Brexit uh, uh, to any detail. Uh, that is uh, normally not the case, but tonight uh, it, uh, it happened. Uh, but of course, you are, uh, I'm sure, fully aware uh, of uh, the direct defiance of the Conservative government to the rule of law as uh, far as the future uh, agreement, you know, future relationship and agreement uh, on future relationship uh, is, uh, is, is concerned with, with regards uh, uh, to Northern uh, Ireland. I think, you know, in terms of contextualizing this, this further, I uh, had the opportunity to speak to Dominic Grieve uh, a few weeks ago when uh, uh, Dominic Grieve is one of our visiting professors at Goldsmiths, and uh, he uh, uh, put it uh, succinctly. Um, 
you know, the threats, the threats to the rule of uh, of law. Um, the government certainly succeeded in damaging one of uh, of the three sources of law he mentioned when he tried to prorogue parliament. It has just damaged the second one in terms of international law by defying the rule of law, uh, by committing through legislation to violate international uh, law, the withdrawal uh, agreement. And John Mogam earlier on, uh, and a really interesting thread uh, there talking about the threats intrinsic in, uh, in uh, the review of judicial uh, review, uh, highlighting our democracy as vulnerable to autocratic power and you know, to be having that discussion in the UK is extremely worrying, is extremely problematic in, uh, in itself. And Joe uh, Mogam, Joel and Mogam there uh, also rightly highlighting uh, the, the, the fact that uh, uh, we you know, we lack a higher law. Uh, again, we can see the connection here between the the first part of my presentation, the lack of constitutional law, the lack of higher law, the lack of a written constitution, um, has uh, had uh, important ramifications in relation to how we treat evidence, improperly obtained evidence in English criminal trials, for instance. Here, another illustration of how it has important uh, ramifications in relation to how we can protect the rule of law. Uh, you know, we don't have as many weapons. Uh, at our disposal, as, may, as some other democracies might might have. It all depends on parliamentary sovereignty. And as I explained before, it's more the sovereignty of the executive rather than parliamentary sovereignty. I mean, uh, the prime minister locked down parliament. You know, I, I don't think he is a great believer in parliamentary sovereignty and obviously referring to the prorogation of, of parliament. Uh, uh, I've also been able to, you know, discuss all this in uh, in more detail in the European Human Rights Law Review in the latest issue that came out in uh, in in August. And the key point there was that uh, the magnitude of the risk that uh, uh, our democracy is facing, that our international uh, in, that international human rights in the UK are facing, cannot be fully grasped unless we undertake an analysis of how Eurosceptic uh, of, of how deep a Eurosceptic anti-human rights executive so uh, sovereignty-centered ideology now runs within the governing uh, party. So the, the paper discusses uh, uh, Dominic uh, Raab and Sola Braveman and Boris Johnson uh, and uh, the late, uh, as far as uh, his uh, involvement in government, uh, uh, Dominic, uh, Dominic uh, Cummings. Uh, um, and of course, uh, the, the threats are political, the threats are cultural. You know, for years uh, we have faced attacks from the tabloids. In recent years, these attacks have been replicated uh, uh, by supposedly respectable broadsheets, but, but you know, the, the, the titles that you're looking at here have created important uh, risks for uh, our democracy, for the rule of law, for judicial, uh, for judicial independence. And the threats are not just there, not just in the in the in in, in the media, not just uh, in the tabloids. Um, you know, you have public intellectuals, and I would uh, invite everyone. I'm, I'm I'm sure many of you will have already engaged uh, with uh, uh, Lord Samson's Reith uh, lectures, where I, I, I'd say, with all due respect, he's undertaken a quite direct attack, direct assault on uh, on the Human Rights uh, Act. Uh, um, and even in parts of academia, we, we see significant uh, threats. We see uh, in parts of academia significant uh, hostility uh, towards human rights, uh, towards judicial uh, power. And again, uh, I'm sure you are all uh, very familiar with uh, um, the aspirations or key aims and objectives of the Judicial Power Project. Which brings me, and I won't be taking more than uh, uh, another five minutes or so, uh, brings me to the need uh, for activist legal academics. It brings me to the need uh, to highlight once again um, the need for us to work uh, together, to, to join uh, forces, uh, to work together in intellectually, um, to open up. Uh, there is no space, there is no scope for us to remain in our ivory towers any longer, or even, you know, to remain um, exclusively concentrated on admin or, or 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 teaching or other key aspects of the of the profession. Uh, you know that goes without saying that they are integral to what we do. Um, but there is a real need, I would uh, I would argue, uh, for uh, the intellectuals in uh, this country, the intellectuals in the academy, 
uh, the liberals amongst us to, to work uh, to work together. And again, I will very quickly bring to your attention then you can go there and check for yourself and you can engage with forthcoming events and you can write to me directly or you can connect with others in the network. You would be warmly welcome. I'll, I'll just give a few quick illustrations here and I've already referred to Britain in Europe, uh, how it came about a few months, actually a couple of months prior to David Cameron announcing uh, the referendum and so the timing for that was, was great um, and we had the ambition to engage with a number of questions then intrinsically, quite naturally, we focused on, on particular questions. So EU citizens' rights were important to us. The future of the Human Rights Act was, uh, was important to us. Uh, we did work on immigration uh, law. Um, we've recently had a report out. Uh, we engaged at the policy making uh, level uh, with, um, with key players uh, in uh, the European uh, Parliament and, 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 you know, try to play uh, um, Play, to play a role, to, to actively influence to the extent that we were able to, uh, you know, these, these debates. Uh, you know, you might think that one think tank in one law school um, driven by uh, a few academics is, going, is not going to do much. But, you know, if these kind of models are replicated across across UK legal academia, then uh, there is a much wider scope that we can achieve things and we can perhaps affect change uh, uh, together. The Knowing Our Rights project is another illustration of that, and I think I explained the key parameters here, how that was funded uh, originally by uh, the Open Society Foundations. One of the key aspects of my work and the work of colleagues in this area is to spread the word, to raise awareness about European human rights. I mean, I saw you earlier on uh, um, the uh, front pages of newspapers that are doing uh, serious damage on uh, the public's perceptions on human rights. And so again, you know, small projects like this need uh, to start to make a, or may make an effort uh, to affect uh, change. Uh, and, you know, this project alone has uh, managed to engage with more than 2,500 students in the last two or three years uh, with virtual workshops and then a significant number of uh, um, of in-person workshops where I and colleagues and you know I have also worked with some youth organizations where we had developed the materials, the PowerPoint presentation, the research, and they would go on and connect with schools. But also the significant part of that, I have done that myself with colleagues, um, particularly uh, in London. Unfortunately, there is, you know, the project is, has, has been quite London centric. As I said, there, there is an ambition. We have done visits outside the uh, outside London and other parts of the UK. But again, you know, I'm stressing the need for uh, for more law schools, for more uh, parts of the academy to be more actively engaged on, on that, you know, to go out and engage with A-levels and GCSEs and speak to students there about immigration law and EU law uh, and criminal justice and human rights and do what they can in order to raise awareness uh, and you know, in order to suppress the myths that are unfortunately promulgated uh, by, by, by the media. And again, just a few visual illustrations of what that type of work involves, you know, going into schools, engaging students, teaching them some debating skills, uh, having them uh, reflect on the importance of uh, the, the influence that the European Convention on Human Rights uh, has had in the UK. You know, what, what the Human Rights Act and what the European Convention on Human Rights have done for, uh, for us. Uh, a number of different other activities uh, that, you know, you can, you can see here. And it's also you know, a fascinating uh, aspect in, in that is that it's uh, it's 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 not a single uh, there's not a single dimension in uh, in that so there are the human rights workshops in schools there are also film screenings you know we did things with the uh, BFI for instance uh, um, we we have a film theater we have a cinema at uh, Goldsmiths uh, uh, you know we have quite active presence in social media media um, we have months upload a number of videos uh, some you know did quite well in terms of uh, uh, attracting interest from from the public, uh, and, and so there's a number of different um, uh, means that uh, that you can use, you know, if you're going to do that uh, work. And of course, the research, and not just in terms of the of, of ref, but also sometimes, you know, even more importantly, there I say, uh, the kind of publication that you need uh, in order to achieve public engagement. Uh, um, so you know, the the, the tabloids uh, and and the blogs. I mean, I've recently been writing for Prospect. Uh, just just an illustration and these these are the kind of means that allow us uh, to communicate the message uh, further 
and then the the openness to others. Uh, so you know, we've been working very closely with Conor Gerty, with Dominic uh, Grieve. Uh, um, here we have Will Hatton, you know, speaking at Goldsmiths uh, on uh, the state we are in with Brexit, or the state we were in with Brexit at the time. Uh, Jessica Simmer QC, uh, who played an important uh, role in uh, in uh, both Miller uh, cases, and then getting together and you know engaging around the research uh, events. Uh, um, the, the 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 former Lord Chief Justice uh, Lord Thomas uh, addressing uh, challenges to judicial independence in the conference that we did with uh, the British with the British Academy. Um, so all that activity in the context of Britain in Europe, uh, the first um, uh, axis, knowing our rights, the second, uh, and more importantly, the key focus of my work in uh, in the recent uh, weeks and months and years, uh, the law program at Goldsmiths. Uh, and so as I explained briefly, and I'm concluding with, with, with this, um, we are injecting elements of that activist work, of that passion for human rights, for passion for international law, passion for the rule of law into the actual curriculum. Um, we have this novel I think idea where we also integrate professional activities like study trips and engaging with uh, visiting professors, engaging with legal professionals uh, as part of contact time. So, you know, you have the lectures, you have the seminars, you also have these activities that are part and parcel of the curriculum and students engage with, with them, have fantastic opportunities to be confronted uh, with key debates of, of our times. There's the interdisciplinary approach, so we work closely with the sociology department, with the media and communications department, uh, uh, with the anthropology department, uh, with the psychology department. You know, they do a, a module on psychology and crime. Uh, there's a module on anthropology of human rights. Again, you know, these are the, the means that may allow us to, uh, to instill on our students a wider understanding of uh, of law and then the legal cosmopolitan perspective as as well where we can to engage with international institutions with leading institutions you know to engage to uh, to tackle the key questions of uh, of our time uh, uh, black uh, lives uh, matter uh, a key illustration uh, uh, here uh, and we've been privileged to, to work with a number of leading uh, scholars you know, we can't do that work alone. I think uh, legal professionals, NGOs, the third sector, legal academics, we all have to work together. And I have to say my experience has been an extremely positive one where I've been able to go out and work with others or invite others to work with us. Um, I say, you know, the response has been one of a warm reception. Um, these leading personalities in, in law were very keen to work with us, perhaps because they could see uh, themselves or their work aligned with what we were projecting. But in any case, I think that legal professionals and NGOs in the third sector more broadly are genuinely very keen to work with academia and to work with legal uh, academia, particularly when all this activity can be placed in uh, uh, the context of, of a vision uh, that uh, you know places uh, the emphasis on socio-political, economic, cultural, institutional understandings of law and not just an understanding that is limited uh, to black uh, uh, letter uh, law. I want to really thank you for, for, for your attention uh, and once uh, again, Ed, thank you so much for your kind uh, invite. Uh, I mean, it's been a pleasure to, to address uh, um, both areas of, uh, of activity in, uh, in recent years. And as I said, I'm very much looking forward to collaborating uh, uh, and hearing from uh, from our participants and potentially collaborating with some of them here in the near future. Thank you, Dimitrios. That was uh, extremely interesting. Uh, and I want to thank you again for coming virtually to UWE to give our uh, attendees such a interesting, stimulating talk. Um, unfortunately, we are running short of time, um, so um, we're not going to be able to take any questions. But would you mind, Dimitrios, if people emailed me the questions and then I perhaps pass them back, pass them to you, and then we can maybe I can then disseminate the answers back to back to the attendees. Is that okay? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I I would be delighted. I would be delighted. As I said, you know, uh, everyone here uh, warmly in invited. Uh, including your colleagues uh, Ed uh, and the department more broadly uh, warmly invited uh, to you know join uh, join forces in, in the way that I've been explaining uh, for the last couple of hours or so. 
That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, and just finally, I want to thank everybody that's turned up tonight. I know, um, you know, this has been, you know, we've been waiting sort of eight months for this and I think it was worth the wait. I think it was fantastic and I think it, it was extremely interesting. So one final thanks to, to Dimitrios and thank you all very much for attending. If you do have any questions and you don't know my email address, if you just Google Ed Johnston at UWE, um, I'll be the first hit and email me your questions and I can pass that on to Dimitrios for you. Uh, I wish you a very good evening and thanks again. Cheers. Thanks Dimitrios for what was a really interesting two part talk. If you've only seen one of the parts, um, I would urge you to search and check out the either part one or part two. Um, very interesting talks concerning stuff that's extremely important. Um, so I'd like to thank Dimitrios for his time and thanks for watching and listening. And next week I will be joined by Jerry Buting, who is or was the co-lead defence counsel in the making a murderer Netflix show, which followed the trial and pre-trial investigation of Stephen Avery. It's sure to be an interesting chat. Thank you.